Okay, everybody. Well, welcome. We are live and we're live on Facebook and we're live on my Facebook and Greg Braden's Facebook and guess who's here. Um, I am just thrilled to be back in touch with my great, great buddy, Greg Braden, who is internationally best-selling author. I always think of him as um, America's answer to Grand Ham Hancock, who has found amazing secrets of the planet and been a tireless explorer for deep, deep truths. Welcome, Greg. Fabulous to have you here. Oh, Lynn, it's so good to see you. And, and thank you for that really beautiful and warm welcome. You're the first person that's ever called me the American Graham Hancock, and I'm uh, I'm going to go with that. I, Graham's a dear brother and uh, don't see him as often as I'd like. He's done amazing work over the years, and he's helped us to see our world in a, in a very new and empowering way. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And as have you. Wonderful. And for anybody who doesn't know who I am, maybe on Greg's um, Facebook page, I'm Lynn McTaggart. I am the author of seven best-selling books, international bestsellers like The Field, The Intention Experiment, The Power of Eight, and much more. And I do a weird thing called intention experiments and power of eight groups. And we're going to explore some of that in our chat, but we're gonna talk about the transhuman movement, which is something that Greg has been diving into and the two of us talking about in recent courses we've done together. So Greg, let's kick it off with what is transhuman? You know, there, <laughs> the, the term transhuman is a relatively new term. The thinking underlying the transhuman movement actually goes back to the beginning of the last century. And it, it comes, Lynn, from a, a conditioning <clears throat> of, of thinking that we are a flawed species by, by nature of our existence, carbon-based life in general and human life specifically, we are, are flawed. And among those flaws, they identify the, the things that make us human, the things that you and I and our community cherish. Uh, many of these organizations identify as flaws, such as uh, our ability to emote and the, the feelings and the empathy and the sympathy and the compassion, they say, that skews our ability to think clearly and to make logical decisions. We're we're told that the human body is frail and powerless and, and weak. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, and so to remedy all of, of these perceived flaws, uh, there have always been technologies that have been proposed. What has changed is just within the last few years, Lynn, the technology has advanced so quick, quickly with artificial intelligence, with uh, uh, certainly nan not just micro, we're talking about nano technology in, in the bloodstream, uh, you know, little sensors, the, the size of, uh, of a bacteria that we can now put into our bodies. I mean, we're talking about sensors that are only atoms thick. The technology has moved so quickly that there now is uh, a growing movement and the momentum and the policies are being drafted and the laws are being enacted to replace much of our humanness with technology. And from my perspective, it's, it's a dangerous thing to do. It's a slippery slope. We'll talk about why a lot of those reasons uh, are from, from our perspective. But from the, the 10,000 foot view or the 30,000 foot view, what we're looking at, Len, we are a rare and precious form of life that are so complex, we're only beginning to understand who we are and what our potentials are. The danger of replacing human biology with technology is that when we replace our natural abilities, including our immune system, including reproductive uh, potentials, including cognitive abilities, we start replacing those with computer chips and chemicals uh, and biological programming, what happens is our natural biology begins to atrophy. Our bodies believe that we no longer need those functions. And so our bodies will stop producing the chemicals, stop producing the hormones, stop growing the neurons, stop uh, uh, enabling the, the immune response 
because the body says, oh, I've been replaced by a technology. I'm no longer needed. That happens in one generation. Next generation, those abilities become an appendage that is lost. And this is how you lose a species. This is exactly how you lose a species by taking the very elements of our existence that we cherish and that we value and engineering them out of, of our lives, replacing them with what in a moment in time is perceived to be a more efficient technology without fully understanding, fully comprehending the repercussions and the ripple effects uh, down, down the road. So this is, is my concern is that we are at a crossroad, Lynn, this isn't something that's going to happen five or 10 years down the road. It's happening right now. It's happening this year, 2023. Proposals are being made through organizations like uh, the World Economic Forum and the United Nations to, uh, to incorporate technology into our biology without fully understanding what those implications are. And, and the danger is that once we give ourselves away to the technology, those abilities are gone. They're not coming back. So I think we owe it to ourselves. And, and Lynn, this is where I think one of the, the many places where your work and my work complement one another so beautifully is I think we owe it to ourselves to know what is our potential? What is it that we're capable of? Who are we as a human species to know that before we give it away? So at least if we do choose to give it away, we are doing it consciously. We know what we're giving away. But my sense is that once uh, the general public begins to understand, the, here's the beauty, the technology that's being proposed to replace our biology, that technology mimics what we already do in our bodies and our cells, except we do it better than the technology does. We, we don't know the upper limits of human potential, human capabilities. We don't know how scalable our neurons are, for example. So we talk about a computer chip. Computer chip is limited by the physics of the stuff it's made of, by the silica. It's fast, certainly. It's efficient, certainly, but it's limited. We do not know the upper limits and how far we can scale our biology. And I think that's the next new frontier. Uh, and I want to preserve that frontier for future generations. So I'll stop there and, and just say, uh, this is my concern. And it's, it's becoming very much the conversation now. It's been the undercurrent for a number of years. Now it's no longer the undercurrent. It's the topic, the hot topic on social media, uh, on the presentations that we're seeing, given that the World Economic Forum, United Nations, and many other uh, medical organizations are now jumping onto the bandwagon. Well, absolutely. And we've all had a little taste of this with the mRNA vaccine for COVID. Um, and now mRNA vaccines are being created for cancer, for all sorts of things. Yeah. And what people have to understand is this vaccine is not a vaccine as we know it. This is a gene manipulator. It's a DNA manipulator. And it is not well tested. I mean, we just have new evidence coming out of Britain where I live, where um, th this is information coming from the government um, that was dug up by someone who was doing research um, on a, and who was ghost writing the book for our health minister at the time of COVID. Mm -hmm. And she unearthed, and it's now been it confirmed elsewhere that there was no safety testing on the mRNA vaccine that was produced in America. And, you know, we found that in, in other forms of it as well. So there's a giant concern and overconfidence, I think, about this whole idea of science. And I think that's what we're really looking at. The idea of a kind of rational view of the universe, so-called rational view of the universe, that is part of our very old scientific story. You know, I like to call it, to summarize it as better living through chemistry. You know, that was the line we grew up with, right, yeah, Greg, yeah, in, yeah. in America, you know, that everything could be solved by modern science. And what we are discovering, as you absolutely talked about, is that 
there is a great lack of understanding of the amazingness of our humanness, of our bodies, the extraordinary untapped abilities of our bodies. Um, and the whole idea of that things like compassion and empathy are flaws yeah. when they are essential to our being. I have a great statistic for you, Greg, that is so shocking to me. One in four Americans, this is a study that just came out, over 65 have no social contact whatsoever, none, zero. One in three Americans report that they are extremely lonely. And what we've discovered from the new science is that far from being a weakness, compassion is essential. I would go as far as to say that community is probably the single most important element we have as human beings. We need to be in groups. We need to not be isolated. And the whole idea that we can replace community and connection and compassion and involvement with each other with computer chips is completely misguided. But the other thing I wanted to say is one thing that I've been exploring, and certainly you have too, is the extrasensory abilities that we already know we have, but we haven't tapped into to the degree that we can. Um, I do a uh, a little sort of party trick on many of my courses where I put little jars of water around the room, or I even do it on Zoom, and I embed a word in the water. Now, there's good science for demonstrating that you can do that. Water is essentially like a tape recorder, as demonstrated by um, several physicists uh, at the University of Milan, but also um, also confirmed by the late Luc Montagne, who was the you know, co-discoverer of the AIDS, AIDS virus. He was doing water experiments and said the same. But anyway, what I discover is an extraordinary number of people get the word. They pick out the word I'm, I've put into the jar, whether it's something like banana or pyramid or whatever, some sort of object word. And, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of object words in the English language, and yet people pick out that word. And that just is one tiny demonstration of a human ability untapped in the main that is far better than any AI program could ever come up with. Yeah, yeah I agree, Lynn. You know, in, in our live presentations, there is a... Uh... A slide that I bring up, it is a, a map of the human metabolic system. And I always give people a heads up before the slide comes up. I said, I'm going to show you the slide. You are not going to be able to read the slide. Don't worry, because no one else can read the slide either, because it is so complex. Everything is interconnected in our bodies with everything else. Uh, and, and the point of this is that when we ingest something into our bodies, anything, whether it's food or a supplement or a drug or, you know, whatever it is, a pharmaceutical, an herbal supplement, whatever it is, it can never affect only one thing. Because we are so deeply connected, everything affects everything else. This is why what pharmaceutical company calls side effects are not really side effects at all. They are direct effects from ingesting a, a foreign substance into the body for example, if you take an antihistamine for an allergy, uh, it, it will help that allergy, no doubt. Also, it may make you sleepy. It'll tell you not to drive or operate heavy machinery. For some people, uh, it makes it hard to urinate. It depends on, on you know, their body chemistry. So it, it has all of these different uh, other direct effects that are called side effects. So there's such a myopic view when it comes to, to science and biology, what they're looking at right now in, in the pharmaceutical industry is they'll look to target one specific effect. And what I'm finding to, to my, uh, not to my surprise, but unfortunately to my horror is that they are doing it. They're neglecting all of the other implications. And I think certainly vaccines are, are a good example of that. 
but it's just the way that we, even the, the AI and the way that we're thinking about replacing, uh, replacing elements of our biology with synthetic technology. But there's, there's a deeper element to this, Lynn, and you and I, we talk about this privately, and, and it, it's a deeply spiritual component uh, in the sense that we are so much more than we've been led to believe. We are not what we have been told, for sure. And we're so much more than we've been led to believe. Now, I'm, I'm going to use a word that means different things to different people. Ultimately, this comes down to what we call our divinity. And a lot of people link divinity with religion. But the true definition has nothing to do. Divinity has nothing to do with religion. When you look at the true definition, divinity is our ability to transcend perceived human limitations. That's all it is. Our ability to transcend perceived human limitations, even if they're not real. Well, our ability to become the best version of ourselves is reliant upon uh, our biology as it is today and the very complex inner, inner workings of that biology. And when we begin to tweak one part of the biology without taking into account all of the implications uh, we have effects sometimes that are, are surprising, often that are not wanted. And science, this is the arrogance, Lynn, of, of the, the science. And many of the scientists I talk to at conferences, they think they've got this all buttoned up. They think they've just got this down to a science. They know exactly how everything works and exactly what's going on. So that if you, they look at us like a machine of, of parts and if a part, if you, if you tweak a part here, they're not taking into account the implications of all of the other places where that part has, has an effect. Uh, you know, a beautiful example of this is cloning. This is just a, another example. There's a mystery that is happening in the cloning sciences. We've all heard of Dolly. Dolly was the sheep uh, that was publicized. There were other clones, but Dolly was the sheep that was publicized. Uh, as the, the, the first uh, mammal clone. And the mystery is at first, everything looked great. Dolly looked just like the, the sheep that she was cloned from. She was healthy enough to reproduce. She produced offspring, but something began to happen prematurely about halfway through her natural lifespan. Her body began to break down. The organs began to break down. The system's respiratory system uh, immune system, and she died at half of the age. This is typical for her species. This is not unusual because the same thing is happening in bovine cloning. They're doing experiments now with with cows, and they're saying the same thing. And they're they're saying, "What's the deal? It's exactly the same DNA. Why are these animals living half their lifespan? Why are their bodies breaking down?" Well, what they're missing, Lynn, is when they go through that cloning process. There's a communication between the DNA in the nucleus of the cell and the DNA that is outside of the nucleus, the mitochondrial DNA. There's a mismatch and that DNA has to be able to communicate with itself. And because of the way the cloning process happens, they're, they're taking it, the DNA is not matched, the communication is lost and the, the life uh, is, is breaking down quickly. And it's a perfect example of how the scientists are not looking at the non-physical relationships. That communication is an energetic relationship. The same thing applies to us, not necessarily with cloning. For us to access our divinity, for us to, to become the best version of ourselves, to be able to access deep states of intuition, altered states of consciousness, to communicate with non-physical forms of life, uh, dolphins, insects, plants, you know, you hear stories of indigenous people communicating with the crops so that they will, they will, will grow and that they will have a, a symbiotic relationship. For us to do that, we need the full complement of our biology. And we begin to replace our, our DNA with synthetic polymers and chemicals in the blood and chips, computer chips in the brain, sensors under the skin, we lose that that part of our biology, ultimately, we are losing access to our own divinity. And there's, there are political consequences, there are social consequences, there are agendas underlying this that we could talk about 
you know, on many of these programs, but I'm confining this to, to the, the events themselves. We are on the precipice of giving our humanness, our very humanness away to technology. There is a battle. There's a battle for our thoughts, for our beliefs. We all know that. Many people don't realize there's a battle for our humanness. And the battleground is playing out uh, with the transhuman agenda for the reasons that we're talking about right now. So I, I just wanted to say that. I know our time is going to go quickly. And I wanted to say there's, there's such a big picture and a big context on the one hand, on the other hand, it's so simple. It just comes down, Len, to us. What is it that we value and what do we cherish? What are the qualities that we cherish as humans? And we must identify and define those because I believe they're worth preserving. And we must make it clear to our regulators, to our politicians, that we will not accept the loss of these very crucial values like sympathy, empathy, compassion, the ability to self-regulate our own biology and so much more. So, so it is, it's a big conversation, Lynn, and I really appreciate you uh, opening the possibility of, of at least beginning at this conversation today. Absolutely. And, you know, Greg, I think about the understanding of biology of scientists and, of course, in medicine, something that I've been studying for 32 years now. And I watch this complete misunderstanding of the human spirit and this lack of taking something really important, in fact, vital and central about being human and discarding it. For instance, some statistics. There was a study and it was a placebo study, but they took a batch of patients and one half of them were given a doctor who said, yeah, take this drug and it'll handle it. Don't worry, you're going to be fine. The other half were given a doctor who said, well, I don't know about this. I'll give you this drug, but I can't guarantee it's going to work. There was a 61% difference in outcome in those patients between one manner of speaking by a doctor and another. Now, doctors don't sit back to think about the implications of this on our biology. The fact that the thought or the words of someone else can have such a profound difference and change all of your biology is extraordinary. And we see it with so many studies of the placebo effect. It's that patient's belief that is central. But there's something more here, and the, the implications of that are so profound, which are, you know, we're born with extraordinary capacities. We don't explore because they are derided by our authority figures. You know, when we're children, tiny children, we know that we can see beyond our senses. We know we can pick up information that's not right in front of us. We know we have powers. And certainly the Nobel Prize was just given to a batch of scientists who have concluded the universe is not real. We are essentially helping to create it, i.e. we are intending it into being. Um, these scientists, uh, Anton Zeilinger, the famous physicist, the Austrian physicist um, among them, who have determined that we are connected, we are entangled. Subatomic particles and all of the things they comprise are entangled. And they've done it through a series of ingenious experiments. These have vast implications for what it means to be human. And yet, we begin to lose our faith in those capacities as we grow, as authority figures like teachers and parents tell us, yeah. no, that's just your imagination. And so we don't understand our ability as creators. I have now witnessed probably thousands of people doing small group intention, intending forever, creating for, together, creating together in small groups. And I've seen, I've just been making a list today of some of the people in my current class and what's gone on. And we've got, had, you know, Leander um, re 
reversing her leukemia. We've had somebody else who was going blind and now has 20, 25 vision. We have uh, people reversing cancer with nothing but intention. I've had two people come out of wheelchairs and much, much, much more people intending and creating their lives. That says something huge about our ability and our relation to the rest of our world that the kind of rationalist approach to biology can never grasp. And if we do try to denigrate that and try to um, adopt a purely materialistic view of our bodies, we are headed for disaster. That has been one of the big problems in modern medicine. Medicine's biggest problem is it assumes everybody is the same. It gives a drug that's the same drug to everybody, assuming it's gonna affect everybody in the same way, whether you're a 20 year old healthy college student or a 65 year old person with multiple illnesses and ailments. So that kind of very reductive view of the body is dangerous enough as it is. And now adding this, these tweakments you know, we have to enhance ourselves as though we, you know, we're just not fabulous enough as we are, we're not enough as we are, is, as you say, very, very scary and has so many implications. So tell us a little bit more about some of the big, broad implications, too, of this. Well, you know, one, Lynn, yes to everything you're saying. And I, I love this conversation. I love having this conversation with you. And I, I know our community appreciates it because we are inundated with so much misinformation, disinformation, propaganda from wherever our news sources are coming from, uh, because they're all, uh, all the news sources are, are flawed because they, they are beholden to corporate interests, to pharmaceutical interests, to uh, lobby interests, you know, whatever it is. So it's really hard to, to get good information and have these kinds of conversations. And uh, another one of the places where you're not hearing a lot about this, we now, so let me, I'll, I'll jump back. In, in 2012, the scientific journals, the tech journals proudly announced the, the development of the ability to edit genes and DNA uh, uh, in the, the Petri dish, but also uh, in vitro. So we can literally edit the genome of a living human in the, the womb of, of the mother, or we can do it before fertilization ever happens. And it's a technology. Is it good or bad, right or wrong? It depends on how it's used. It's the thinking underlying that technology. If um, you know, if there is a uh, propensity for uh, a deformity or something in the body, it could be a beautiful thing for, for a child. But now what is happening is the, the transhuman agenda is why wouldn't we do this with all natural living humans? Why wouldn't we engineer every embryo to optimize all the potentials and give that life all, all of the, uh, the, all the benefits that come from what is now called CRISPR gene editing. CRISPR is the technology. It was introduced in 2012. So now the question is, whose idea of perfection uh, is going to be used? Is it uh, you know, determined by eye color or hair color or fast twitch muscles for athletic performance or, or more IQ? And this is a very real conversation that's happening. Now that we have the ability to do this, they're saying, because we have it, we owe it to ourselves to use it. And so now they, they, the proposals are to begin gene editing children. We lose our diversity as a species when, when we begin doing things like that. And again, this is, this is an example, Lynn, of where the technology has advanced faster than the morality of how that technology is used. And we've got to, to catch up quickly. And once again, identify the values. What is it that we cherish? about our own lives? What do we cherish about our families and our communities, our society, our, our nation? And make those known uh, and allow them, claim them as the foundation for the policies that are dictating how these technologies are moving forward. 
because without that, the tech is just moving. A perfect example, Elon Musk. Uh, we all know who Elon Musk is. He's brilliant. He's wealthy. He's a visionary. And he's pushing, pushing limits. And he now is the first company to develop what's called the Neuralink. It's the chip that it's not actually implanted into the brain. It's in the space beneath the skull and above the brain. And it has uh, 124 microfibers that, uh, 128 microfibers that extend into the neocortex of the brain to, to pick up the signals, they bring them up to the chip. It does the, uh, translates those and then sends that information wirelessly to your computer. So like Bluetooth technology. So now you're talking to your computer without using a keyboard. And the young people are just mesmerized by this technology because it means they can do their gaming without using a keyboard. And young people who have never been taught about their own bodies, uh, about the potential of their bodies, about uh, how precious human life is, that see it simply as a machine, are really vulnerable to, to wanting to embrace these technologies What's the problem? The problem is that when our brain, we are producing new discoveries are showing we're producing new neurons until the last breath of our life. When I was in school, when I was a kid back in the 50s and 60s, <laughs> we were told you come in with X amount of brain cells and every, every beer you drink or every glass of wine, you're going to lose some. So that was, that was the leverage, you know, when we were young. Now we know we're producing those neurons until our last breath, but there's a catch. If our neurons are not engaged in a meaningful way uh, within 10 days or approximately 10 days of, uh, of emerging, they atrophy and they die. They must be engaged in, in a meaningful way. So we've got computer chips and we've got virtual realities where three-year-olds and four-year-olds are, are looking into a visor and look at, look at what's happening. Lynn. Everything's being done for them. They are observing rather than using their imagination and their creativity to, to create scenarios. They're simply watching these extraordinary colors and extraordinary situations they, that make everyday life pale in comparison. And the sounds and now the, the studies, the science is showing, reports are coming out in peer-reviewed journals about changes, uh, thickening of the visual cortex, changes in the cognition, uh, in the speech patterns, and in the social, certainly in the social skills of, of young children who are engaged in these kinds of technologies. So this is all part of the, the transhuman movement. It is, it is merging external technology with our internal biology. And I think it's, it's up for all of us right now. And it's, um, it's a, a conversation that's not easy for some people. And there are certainly politics involved. There are agendas involved. There's economics, there's finance, there's health. It's, it's a place where all of these things meet. And it all comes down to, to a new human story. We're building a new human story, Lynn, through the work of, that you are doing and, and showing about how we're able to connect uh, with the field that underlies all of existence, the power of intention, the power of thought, feeling, emotion, belief, all of those things is a new human story. And it's, it's a beautiful story of hope and possibility. And it also tells us that we are at a very critical crossroad in our evolution right now, uh, where we have the technology that allows us to lose the very qualities that we cherish as a species. So I think it's important for us to acknowledge that. Absolutely. And, and that we aren't even completely aware of because of this reductive scientific view of what it means to be human. Many of the ancients understood these latent extrasensory capacities, um, but they've been lost in modern science, essentially. One of the things that you talked about a lot, and I want to just explore a little, is the central problem of this transhuman movement is a sense of over-optimism about what can be achieved without any harm done. 
And that is the problem of modern medicine. As I say, I've been studying this for 32 years with our magazine, What Doctors Don't Tell You. And there isn't a drug out there that doesn't have potential catastrophic side effects for some. And the problem is we cannot determine who's going to suffer with any certainty, who's going to suffer side effects and who isn't. And that is the overconfidence that all of modern medicine comes. And you, you mentioned there's a lot of other things at play here. There's politics, there's economics, there's big money behind a lot of this. And that is the worry because big money also corrupts, corrupts the kind of science that needs to be done to look at this stuff dispassionately and to say, does it work? But even more fundamentally, is it necessary? And you and I, the answer is not only is it not necessary, but is potentially dangerous. As you say, if, if you give somebody who doesn't really need it, thyroid drug, extra thyroid or extra adrenals, those adrenal glands, those thyroid glands will begin to atrophy, as you say. So hmm. when we start thinking about young people and trying to augment their brains, as we know, the science shows us that what you focus on, what you use most, thickens, gets bigger, gets more neurons. So you know that with a violin player, the parts of the brain involved with playing that violin get bigger the more that person practices. So if all you're doing is passively looking at something and not involved in the world, that involvement in the world, all those neurons involved with your involvement in the world begin to atrophy. So we've all worried about what happens to young people with social media. But look at this, if they're very sensory, the organs are beginning to atrophy because they're not used. That's very worrying. Even more, if their communication skills, their connection skills atrophy, that actually is dangerous for the planet. It's dangerous for the planet. I read something recently. It's really interesting. I was reading about self-organization in the midst of revolutions, um, because I've been thinking a lot about all my power of eight groups. I've started realizing I kept walk around thinking we need an army of change makers. And I suddenly realized I've got an army of change maker. There's tens of thousands of these power of eight groups around the world now. And I'm, just want to call them in. But I was reading the other day about self-organization because we we see that, you know, the, the people in charge really don't know what they're doing. You know, I mean, we watch things from a, a perspective over here in the UK and we're just shocked by how much the people in charge don't know what they're doing. And we've reached a level of corruption um, and, and a corporate tyranny that looks like it's almost beyond repair. So I've been starting to look at ground up movements and I find what's so interesting about humans in so many movements, when you look at um, things like the, the Prague revolution, you see that people spontaneously self-organized and things worked well at a small level, at a, at a local level. And so, what I start looking at is, as I say, I think one of the biggest problems we have now isn't even a crisis of heat or, or oil or energy. No. It's a crisis of community and connection. I think if that breaks down completely, and I think it is for people, this is one of the biggest problems. It is one of the drivers, biggest drivers of ill health. And so what we can't lose is one of the central pieces of our humanity, which is our ability to connect, our need to connect. Yeah. Oh, I, I could agree more, Len. And this is now you're looking at the 30,000 foot view as, as we take a look at even bigger and bigger implications of, of what's happening here. The, the adoption of so much technology by our young people is... Uh, is part of 
what I believe is an organized effort. I think this is intentional to break social alliances. We have been programmed for division. We, we've been programmed to pit rich against poor, men against women, blacks against whites, Christians against Muslims. Uh, you know, and now, now we're blurring the lines between adult and childhood and men and women and what all these things are. And, and each one of those is important and needs to be discussed. The ultimate implication is that social alliances, traditional social alliances are being broken. And when that happens, we become more isolated. And I think this is what you were talking about uh, in the beginning of our, our conversation and people feeling lonely. And in our isolation and with our broken social alliances, we become vulnerable as a society. We become vulnerable uh, as individuals. We become vulnerable as nations to other people's ideas, other people's visions, and other people's agendas of what our lives and our world should look like. And I think that you just mentioned, you said the words, it's a danger, a uh, danger to the planet. And I think this is depending on what your vision for the planet is, uh, it can be very dangerous because as we lose our identity, and this is exactly what's happening, our identity is, is men and women, our identity is adults and children, our identity is uh, you know, communities and, and all the things that we're, that we're seeing happen. We have to, how can we solve the problems if we're not honest about the problems? And we have to be honest and say, these things are happening and what are the, the implications? What are the outcomes? And as we become more vulnerable to, and there are multiple competing visions and multiple competing agendas for where the, the, where the world's going and what the world should look like, uh, the transhuman agenda is what supports and makes those agendas and those visions possible. So, so you know, the ultimate the ultimate goal stated by those who uh, who are driving this agenda is immortality, Len, and I think it's interesting. Uh, they believe that consciousness is much, nothing more than little ones and zeros, binary data that we can load from our brain onto a computer chip. This is this is what they actually write about and believe, and that. When our body dies, our consciousness is on that chip, and now you can download that into a new body, whether it's a robotic body or a natural human body or another form of life. That's what they believe. The part they're missing is that we are already capable of longevity extending far beyond what we're led to believe right now. Every organ in the human body is now documented with the ability to stop the breakdown, to heal the damage, to repair and to reverse the aging, every organ in the human body, if it's given the right environment. We are a rare form of, of life, the only one that we know of on earth today that can consciously, consciously choose to self-regulate our own biology, that we can regulate uh, an enhanced immune system, enhanced immune response on demand, awaken our longevity enzymes. And if you have longevity, it means you're healing all along the way. It's not just about a long life. You have to be healing to have that long life. So we have longevity enzymes that, that we awaken, super memory, super recall, super cognition, super resilience. All of this is at our fingertips because we have the ability to self-regulate our own biology. And this is what is overlooked in, uh, in this view of a powerless, frail human existence, they have failed to recognize that we literally, lit you and I have talked about this, you, we are literally a soft technology. We're not made of computer chips and wires and AI and sensors. We are neurons, cell membranes, ion potentials moving across cell walls. And we self-regulate all of that through thought, feeling, emotion, belief, breath, focus, intention. That is, that is an extraordinary technology when you really begin to think about what we are. So when we, and I, I fully realize it's a very different way of thinking for many people. We don't think of ourselves as, as a soft technology. When we begin to, to allow ourselves to, to see ourselves in new and empowering ways, we see less need 
and we feel less urgency to embrace the outer technology to make us healthy and to be successful in life because we recognize it's there for those that need it. And there are some people I'm happy it's there, that external technology. But most of us don't need it because we are the technology and we have that ability uh, to, to awaken all these extraordinary potentials. That's our divinity our ability to transcend our perceived human limitations. Absolutely, Greg. And that is the that is the tragedy of what's going on now, is it is blinding us to our extraordinary ability to self-regulate. And it doesn't require, you know, masses of uh, high-tech uh, vitamins and minerals. It doesn't require that if you look at the longest living people on the planet many of them live in very rugged environments you know people in sardinia um some of the longest and living people on the planet um are there are out there you know herding goats at the age of 85 and 90 and still able to have you know full capacity full use of their bodies, et cetera. So it's what we have to learn, which is we have to learn what we already have and really appreciate it and understand those extra human capacities that we have that differentiate us. We have some questions and I know you've got to, you've got a hard stop. So let's take some of them and we'll trade them back and forth. All right. Okay. Um, Right. Somebody asked, by the way, will this program be on humanity's stream? Well, this program that we're doing right now is a free conversation between Greg and me, and it will be available uh, on Facebook, um, both of our Facebook pages, and it'll be available on my podcast and more. Um, so, and somebody else is asking, let's see. Can you address any healings for ALS and Parkinson's by intention and current science from the standpoint of physiology and resonance? Is the Blessed Mother a part of your equations? Well, let me take that, that answer. Yeah. That's from Deborah. Um, we've had people with Parkinson's who have been extraordinarily better, if not healed, through the power of intention. We've had people with multiple sclerosis. I had a woman with one intention, one power of eight group, get up out of her wheelchair and more. So those kinds of illnesses, we've seen effects through the power of group in intention. Current science from the standpoint of physiology and resonance, you know, what we have to do is get away from the idea of ourselves as a, a batch of chemistry and electrical signaling. You know, we are it, at our nethermost level. We are vibrating packets of energy. We are an energetic system. And so when we start thinking of our bodies that way, then intention becomes understandable. The idea that a group thought around you can have an effect that can change your life in some way, that can heal you, that can heal your finances or your career or propel you on a new life purpose or heal your relationships. That doesn't make any sense from our current scientific model, but it makes perfect sense when you suddenly understand us as quantum entities. Okay, so yeah, Lynn, I, I just have to say, I love it when you put those glasses on. You look, that's how I know it's good. It's about to get really serious that we're really going <laughs> to drill down. And, and you know, that's a really good question. And people ask me specifics all the time. Can, can heart brain coherence contribute to healing cancer or, you know, ALS or whatever? And what I'm going to invite people to do is answer this question for yourself by thinking about what we've said here. Every organ in the human body has been scientifically documented to stop the breakdown of the organ, number one, to repair the damage the organs already experienced, number two, to reverse and heal and rejuvenate and regenerate, number three, even organs we were told could not, heart tissue, brain tissue, pancreatic tissue, spinal cord tissue, the key is that the 
the organ must be immersed in the proper environment. Now that environment can be nutritional. It can certainly be external environment, good water, good air, that's all important. But the most powerful of all the environments is the inner environment of thought, feeling, emotion, belief, and intention, because that is our access to the field that Lynn is talking about. And, and Lynn, this is what you said is so true. You know, people can do this at home in their living rooms. And what we've seen is when large groups of people tend to come together at, at the events where you get a thousand or two thousand, three, four thousand people in a room, we're sharing a heart field, number one, from our physical hearts, the electromagnetic field. But and we're accessing an even deeper field that you talk about through your book, the field and through the power of eight and, and the power of intention. Uh, and so those effects that would happen when we're alone are enhanced to an even greater degree. And you can feel it. It's just a good vibe, you know, when you're in the room. So I just wanted to, to chime in with that. Thank you, Lynn. And, and you look really like you're going to look very studious right now. So I'm ready for this next question. <laughs> You got you got to read the small print with the glasses on, guys. Um, so, right, this is an interesting one. Kyle says, "How do we scientifically study our capabilities without reducing them to just scientific processes, compassion, empathy, and science, spiritual experiences?" Well, first of all, I want to refer you to a very interesting book by Rupert Sheldrake. Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, the, bio, the famous biologist, called The Science Delusion. And one thing we think about science, we think about science as this amazing finite truth. Um, what he discovered was when he looked at different kinds of science, he looked at regular science, and I don't remember the exact percentages, but regular science, he looked at overall how much was good rigorous study and he found something like 36% was good, rigorous scientific method. Then he looked at medical studies and he found like something like 20%, if not 15% were good medical studies. Then he looked at things like psi, spiritual, you know, studies of spiritual experiences of extrasensory um, perception, et cetera. And he found that Something like three quarters of all of those studies, 75% of them were truly scientific. So the answer to that, Kyle, is that actually we can study these capabilities. Certainly I've done 40 intention experiments working with different scientists around the globe. We've tried to do everything from make plants grow faster to purify water with our thoughts to lower violence in war-torn areas, we've done 10 of those, yeah. and to healing someone of post-traumatic stress disorder. Of those 40, and as I say, we've worked with science scientists from University of Arizona, University of California, Penn State University, Princeton, and more. Of those 40, 36 have shown measurable, positive, mostly significant effects. So there's probably no drug out there with that kind of consistent track record. So just, we can study them. But secondly, the proof is in the doing. I think if you have a power of eight group and you suddenly are working with them, you're suddenly using intention and it's healing people in the group of serious illnesses. Or if you're suddenly realizing after practice and technique and et cetera, that you can make use of extrasensory uh, perception, that you're picking up the thoughts of other people. That's one thing I teach, um, that you are self-regulating through heart-brain coherence as Greg teaches. You know, suddenly you recognize the proof is in the doing. You have demonstrated this because it works. Do you want you know, to say Lynn, I, I, I was blessed. At, uh, so beautiful what you're saying. I, I was blessed to share the stage with uh, physicist Michio Kaku. I think many of our, our viewers are very familiar with his work back in the 1990s. And we were having this conversation. And what he said was, when you talk to the scientists, if they're really honest, many of the scientific inquiries begin with non-science. They begin with intuition. The scientists will have an intuitive hit on some relationship. They'll use the science to explore it, 
But the very, uh, the very thing that we're talking about, the things that can't be measured are what initiate the scientific uh, exploration to begin with. So uh, I think our, our intuition is a, a deep part of everything that happens here and, and non-physical aspects of uh, everything we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for another question? We do. We do. Thank you. And I'm whizzing through them. So um, <laughs> this trend in transhuman, writes Kat, is being led by non-humans. What action is needed by your listeners to outsmart an iterative AI that moves in a straight line only? Greg, I'm, why don't you say well, something I'm just. I'm going to say this a really quick answer to this question. There is a battle for our thoughts, there's a battle for our beliefs, there's a battle for our bodies. All of that, from my perspective, is uh, that's noise. That is the, 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 the noise, the distraction from the ultimate battle for our very humanness. And the way that we triumph in this battle is simply by becoming the best version of ourselves, by becoming the best version of whatever that means for you and your life. You don't have to fight anything back when you claim your power, when you claim your divinity as a pure human in, in this world, you've won the battle. And I, I think about that every day. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to always be pushing and fighting. And it, it makes me feel ways that I don't like to feel. So I prefer to celebrate our humanness, to celebrate the extraordinary potential and the capacity and to live that in my family, in my friends, in my life, in my events at the grocery store, wherever I am, celebrate the, the most extraordinary abilities and to develop your abilities, to develop your divinity, allow your divinity to shine through. You've won the battle because that's it, is to claim the deep truth of what it means to be pure human. Absolutely. And I want to say, too, that we do have the capacity. A lot of people I'm reading in 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 the questions, and we're going to have to go in a few minutes, everyone. Um, a lot of people are saying, well, how do we defeat these evil forces? How do li little we do this? I want to tell you, as I say, I've been studying a lot of small movements. I've been looking at Gandhi. How did Gandhi defeat yeah. the British and win independence for India, but not only independence, but self-sufficiency? He did it by starting small. He worked with small groups in communities. And you know what he gave them? He didn't give them rifles. He gave them a, a spinning wheel. He said, if you have your own, um, uh, your own ability to create a community with and create money, you will be self-sufficient. You won't need British interference. You won't need big governmental interference. And so for me, I think the way forward is instead of this ever more global connection that we've been heading toward, which is the root of a lot of tyranny, I think we reverse that process and we meet in small groups. We start in small groups. And that's certainly what I'm trying to do with our Power of Eight groups. And I'll soon be releasing some tools that I call tools for a new world that will just be, what do you do with these groups then? How can we cre reclaim our humanity on this kind of level? And Margaret Mead said it, you know, whenever there is massive social change, it always starts with a small group, always. And every major movement in history has started with a small group. So we have that capacity. You know, human beings do constantly reinvent themselves, and we have the capacity to do so now. Greg, I know you have to go give everybody a, a view, an interview of what your next project is. What are you doing now? What do they need to know about? You know, the things that we're talking about right now, Lynn, stay tuned to our, uh, our website, our YouTube channels a lot of new content I'm, I'm developing personally. I'm working with other people, including you, Len, uh, to do just this. If, if we allow ourselves to sink into the anger and the hate, it keeps us locked in the fear of uh, the ancient battle that's playing out. When we rise above that by focusing 
on our greatest potential, uh, the best version of ourselves. It's different for everyone. The best version of ourselves and what it means to be human, that is how we triumph. And you don't even have to fight. All you do is, is live your life in joy. And with that, Lynn, I'm, I'm going to have to jump off. Uh, I've got a, a group. I'm taking a group into Peru. Peru is having a difficult time now. We have an emergency meeting uh, about what's happening in Peru. I understand. That's, that's, I just want, I want you and our community to know that's why I'm leaving so quickly. I love you all. Lynn, my dear, dear friend thank and you. esteemed colleague, thank you for sharing part of your day and your community with me today. Thank you so much, Greg. And I'll just let everybody know too, to find out more. Bye, Greg. Thank you Bye -bye. so much for being here with me. For everybody else, if you want to find out more about what I'm doing, it's lynnmctaggart.com. I've got my big Power of Eight Intention Masterclass coming up on February 4th. Find out more about it on my website. We'll also be having those free tools for a new world um, to tell you how to move forward and create your group and essentially change your communities, change the way you live and learn how to survive and thrive, even in these challenging times. So check it out. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you soon.